Hello. So, yeah, welcome to our talk. My name is Eric. And you, uh, my name is Matthias. Uh, and yeah, we are going to run you through um, some new features in Solidity that we worked on in the past month. Um, and so we have the link to the slides um, on the slide itself and also this QR code. We're quite curious if this works for you. Uh, <laughs> we tested it numerous times, but you never know. And every phone is special. Works. Awesome. Yeah, but I mean, at least it looks nice. No, it, it did work, apparently. <laughs> oh, okay. At least one person managed. Um, yeah, so I will quickly run you through the agenda. So first we want to talk about some language features, um, the most prominent ones. Um, also, we have introduced some compiler features, like some changes there. Um, thanks. Okay. Um, so, and then the next point is like future development. What are we like planning to do in the in the in the future? And um, yeah, so we will also have a Q and A session afterwards. Um, and so let's start with the language features. Um, yeah, quite exciting stuff going on there. Yeah, we spent quite a lot of time on. Uh, and my mic just went out. Okay, a new inheritance system, which doesn't actually mean in, like there are no actual new features. We added keywords and checks that you can program in a more safe way that the compiler does more checks. So, uh, starting with override and virtual, uh, you know them probably from other languages, C++, etc. Here you see uh, a con written in the pre-060 version. There's nothing special to see here. You see we overriding the contracts three times to the total supply function. We always call the base function of the previous one. And yeah, nothing special here. This changed in the new version to look like this. Basically, so you see we have a virtual keyword which you need to specify if you want to override a function. Otherwise, you can't override it. And similarly, you have to specify override in the function that you're overriding. And again, virtual if you want it to be overridable. So it's not implicitly virtual again. And in the final inheritance here, we didn't specify virtual because we don't attend, intend to override again. Um, yes, and so far we have multiple inheritance. In pre-060, it looked like that. There is, again, nothing especially exciting to see about this. We have the RC 777 contract, which implements also IRC 20. Uh, we just showed the total supply function here with one implementation. And in the new version, you now have to, um, yeah, again, Hold on a second, I'm slightly confused. Right, okay, so you see uh, it's, an, it's an interface. That means you don't need to specify virtual because it's an interface. It can't have an implementation and it must be overridden, so no virtual required. In the deriving function, you need to specify all the contracts or interfaces that you want to override. If you leave out one here, it will be an error and the compiler will yell at you. Also, if we were inheriting from two contracts with their own implementations, then uh, you still need to override it explicitly. If you leave out the whole implementation in the derived class, it will also be an error. So we want you to be explicit and to know what you're actually, which base implementation you're calling or doing your own implementation. Then we're moving on to abstract contracts. In pre-060, um, again, a simple, a simple uh, example here. We have total supply defined but not implemented. And this, well, it compiles. It gives you no error. No code is generated for the total supply function because there's none. And you will get an error if you try to new this contract, but not before. So you might have silently not working code in your, and your compiler would not tell you, and in your code base you wouldn't notice. 
Now, with after 060, we introduced the abstract keyword, which you can see at the top. And now, you will get an error, as shown here, because you haven't implemented that function. And you must specify abstract if you have um, an abstract function, like without a body. So it tells you here that you should either make this contract also abstract, or you provide an implementation. This um, propagates more safe code, and you catch mistakes earlier in the whole process. Then uh, a small new thing regarding interface inheritance. You can now inherit from interfaces, which wasn't possible before. So you can easily show that the interface for ERC-777 is also an interface for ERC-20. And yeah, those are so far the inheritance features. Moving on to fallback and receive split. Thanks. Um, yeah, so in the fashion of um, being more explicit in your contracts or in contracts in general, um, we also decided for a fallback and receive split. Um, so I will show you what that means. So this is a pre-060 contract um, with a fallback function defined. Um, and um, this is called for both, so for non-existing uh, function signature or um, if there's any ether received. Um, so what's, what's happening here? So if you send um, any ether, um, the, uh, the transaction is successful and the contract keeps the ether. Um, so we decided to split it up uh, into the first part, which is um, receive. So we introduced a new receive uh, keyword here. Um, the function signature of the receive function looks kind of uh, similar, but without uh, the function keyword. Um, and um, receive is being called um, if you send any ether to the contract via send or transfer. Um, and this contract reverts um, if, you call, uh, if you call a non-existing function. Um, and to handle this part, there is the um, default part of it. So um, just before the talk, um, we talked quickly about like the proxy pattern. And so uh, I'm quite happy that uh, we have this example here. I mean, um, that's the pre-060 uh, the, the, um, uh, pre, uh, version of it. So there's um, the fallback function. Um, and in there, you have an inline, inline assembly code, uh, which then uh, has like the delega delegate call magic. Um, and this is uh, called for both, um, or was called for both, um, for non-existing function or ether, um, if any ether was received. Um, and here we uh, introduced the fallback keyword. Um, so um, this contract then gives you a warning because there's no receive ether or receive function implemented. And the compiler, yeah, as I said, um, gives you this warning. Um, and then you can just implement the receive and the fallback function uh, and then do in this functions uh, what I need to do there. Um, and just um, a quick wrap up. Um, so the receive is executed if there's like a plain ether transfer, and fallback is executed if there's a matching function signature, or there's an empty data field, um, and there's no repeat function. Um, the next one might be a little bit controversial, but I think for the sake of clarity, um, it's a pretty nice feature. Um, so we made the dot length um, member of Aries read only. Um, so it's a little bit hard to come up with a good example here, but we just th thought, okay, we will um, have this stack. Um, yeah, it's a contract called stack, and you can um, pass it a length via the constructor. And um, this is um, the pre uh, the pre 060 behavior. And then you would have like a push and the pop function. So um, nothing special here. Um, but it has some some pitfalls. So I mean, first of all, you could pass like a, a very high number as the length, and this could result um, into um, overlapping storage. And also, accessing dot length looks cheap, but if you want to delete, um, then it's quite expensive. And um, so, what I was what I said before is. 
um, making this read-only prevents multiple ways of accessing storage here. Um, and this is the 0, uh, 060 version. So um, it should do the same, um, but here in the constructor, you would need um, to define a loop, for example, use an empty push function, um, and then uh, push and pop um, are implemented, uh, implemented similarly. Um, and this code, uh, we hope that it's more explicit because you would see the cost of it. Um, instead of just assi assigning to length, you would uh, use this loop, for example. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, the next one, it's something we are really excited about. It's the um, try-catch support. Um, so just to give you an example how this could work. So we have a, a pre-060 contract here. Um, and um, we have the contract consumer and it has a feed and a rate function. And now the thing is you want to react on the revert in the, um, in the function data. Um, but how would you do that? So there was no, um, there's no way of doing that. Um, so we decided to go for a try catch pattern that you um, probably know from uh, other programming languages. Um, and this is a 060 version um, of the contract. So again, um, the data fun um, in the, the body of the data function just reverts. And here in the rate function, um, there is the new try-catch pattern. So as you can see, um, you could just call the function again and then keep the return, um, uh, define the return values. Uh, and in case there is um, no, uh, no revert or uh, no, um, no assertion failing, um, this would, in this example, then return the value and flag the call as successful in this example because <coughs> um, yeah, the rate function has um, uh, you and then a bool as a return value, so for the actual value and um, a flag that um, states the success for, of, the, of the call. And in this example, so there is a reason given for in the revert, so a revert reason. Um, and the first catch block that you could um, implement um, reacts on that. So in this case, because the function always reverts, we would um, reach the, ca the, the, the catch branch um, and you could ex read out the, the actual string that was given. In this case, we return a zero and um, mark this or flag this as not successful. Um, there's uh, another uh, branch that you could also implement. So just imagine you have a revert without the reason string, or like I said, an assertion that fails. Um, you could uh, define another catch branch here that reacts um, on the low-level data. Uh, and then here you could do whatever you want. Um, and it's also possible to, to use both. So um, we just wanted to keep it out because then the example would have been too big. But usually um, you would implement both branches. Um, what else to say? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, let's, let's talk afterwards if there are any questions. Um, yeah, next are the function call options, and Matthias will take over again. Yes, function call options. You might know them as dot gas and dot value, as shown in this example, to transfer way or gas to the function that you're calling. Um, we changed the syntax of this. Um, it, this change was triggered by actually another feature that will come right after this. But I actually like the new syntax a lot. It follows the named arguments syntax. So you specify curly, in curly braces the variable names and then the values. And I think it looks less confusing because, because before it looked like another function call, which it really wasn't. So I think this is a big plus. And it is also very consistent with uh, the new feature, which is high-level support for Create2. 
So this is one um, I really like because if you wanted to create a new contract using Create2, you had to do it manually in inline assembly, as shown here. You first had to get the code from the contract you want to create, in this case, product. Then we call Create2 in low-level low assembly with 10-way. Uh, we specify the code, we specify the length of the code, and we specify an individual salt, which is creatively named salt in this example. We check if the creation succeeded, we, re we revert if it doesn't. And um, there's actually a problem with this, apart from being very low level. And some of you might see it, some don't. Does anyone see a problem here? All right, that's why we introduced this. I didn't see it in the beginning either. So here, the new syntax, really just call new in the contract. You use the named argument syntax from before for function call options. You specify the salt and the way you want to send. And the difference here is it's easier to pass arguments to the constructor, which we didn't even show in the previous example. But you notice we have now a constructor that is payable. We actually needed one, but the compiler couldn't check it before because it didn't really know what we're doing in the low-level assemble. Now this wouldn't compile if I hadn't added this constructor. And if you don't specify salt here, then it would be just a normal new, a normal create call, basically. And um, I think, yes, these are all the noteworthy mentionings of here. Um, we have some miscellaneous features we also want to mention, but weren't big enough to warrant whole slides. Eric, would you like to introduce? Um, yeah, so we have global enums and structs, so they don't need to be defined in a contract anymore. Um, we also use array slices for arrays, and which yeah, I mean the syntax, yeah, you probably know the syntax from other languages, so you would just define um, the begin text um, in the brackets. And finally, we have a new um, ASM statement, leave. You might know return, which basically ends the whole function call context. Leave just ends the current UL function, so you can be more precise um, where to exit and have more freedom in your control flow. We're moving on to a tool that Eric wrote almost alone. Um, yeah, so this tool is called Solidity Upgrade, um, and it came out of the necessi necessity. Um, like to just give you a quick little. So in our testing pipeline, we have some external projects and therefore contracts that we always are testing with uh, new compiler versions. So want to see um, how the changes that we're doing actually affect basis, existing code bases. So we have, for example, open and we have notes. Um, and developing these features, we have to upgrade um, the contracts. So, and as Matthias already told, inherited clarifications would need a lot of um, manual updating of the contracts. So, and just to cut this a little bit down, we decided to um, build this tool on our own. And then it turned out that there was like some, also some public interest in it. And then we said, okay, yeah, why shouldn't we make this like kind of public and write some nice documentation on it? And so this is the reason why this tool ended up in the talk. And it's like kind of, yeah, kind of simple. So it's based on libsolidity. So it's a C++ tool. And it just parses and compiles through Solidity, and it's a hybrid solution. So um, we are uh, checking the errors that are like being reported by the compiler, and then uh, we are doing like a simple textual source manipulation based on regular expressions on the contract itself. Um, so, for example, this is a pre-060 version, uh, just like three contracts, and um, there's like some inheritance in it, and. Compiling this with the newest compiler version would lead to several errors that are being reported, but the tool is able to upgrade the contracts for you. Um, and 
yeah, I will just quickly show you the, um, the command line invocation here. So the tool, like as I said, is called Solidity Upgrade. You would just pass a source um, file. And for the previous example, there are no errors um, being reported, or no errors left, because there are no upgrades. So you could also have the situation that there are still errors that the tool couldn't upgrade itself. So we implemented the zero, most of the 060 features that are um, that the tool is able to upgrade automatically. So for example, the inheritance features. But for, of course, so because the semantics of an assignment to the length member of an array is not so easy, so we left that out. And we also experimented a little bit and integrated some 0.5 uh, zero features. For example, the um, uh, default for functions and um, yeah it would, we would love to to get some feedback on it so if you're interested just consult the documentation um, there's a subsection in the compiler uh, in the section using the compiler um, yeah and yeah we're kind of interested um, if this is like useful uh, for contract developers um, next one compiler features so we, I think we are running over them with a detail here. So the first one, which is also an interesting feature, is the, um, the JSON import. So before, I don't know, I couldn't remember which version was it introduced. I think it was introduced in 0 060, right? Uh, I think so too, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as you might know, it's possible to export the AST in a JSON uh, format. And now it's possible to import this again and then run the compilation on the imported AST. Uh, we also put a lot of effort into the eWASM backend. So every feature that is, um, do you know the intermediate representation called dual, like the inline assembly uh, language? Um, so, yeah, as I said, this is the uh, intermediate representation um, of our Solidity code. So everything that can be compiled through Yule, like every uh, Solidity construct that can be compiled through Yule, can now also be compiled to uh, EWASM, which is a WebAssembly subset f for the EVM. Yeah, um, the ABI encoder version 2 is no longer considered experimental. We still need to specify the same old Pragma experimental uh, instruction to use it, though, so that you don't have to update the contracts, mainly. Um, not considered experimental means um, there are no warnings anymore if you use it, and there is no experimental literally in your bytecode when compiling it yet. Um, Otherwise, the Yule optimizer, Yule is basically our intermediate and assembly language, is now also no longer experimental and is automatically activated when you specify the normal optimize flag. Before, you had it had its own flag. Um, we are going to have a short look into future things we're currently working on, starting with the Yule backend, which basically means compile Solidity first to Yule and then compile that to the EVM or whatever backend we want. Then I think this is your part. Okay, um, so we also looked into a LSP implementation, so a language server protocol. Um, that's quite useful for IDE integration. We just started looking into the specification that comes from Microsoft. Um, and yeah, I think there's a prototype. And because we have the feeling that the community is quite interesting, uh, interested in this feature, we, yeah, we are also eager to implement that. And then, yeah, there's some other things, but no word, like worth to mention here is like the mutable and mutable variables um, that could be, for example, only assigned once in the, um, in the constructor and are then constant. Um, so, but this is also like an, like an open discussion. And if you feel um, that you want to contribute or like participate in the discussion, um, you could just like look through our issues and uh, try to find the discussion there. Also, 
we have a mailing list. I think it was set up like a year ago. Right now, there's not. We are we are <laughs> we are trying to actually <clears throat> open up discussions there. And it's a Google user group, and there are like some posts and like some things going on, and we would really love to see more people participating in the docu um, in the in the discussions there. The important thing to note here is it's about language development here, not about questions about solidity or things like that. I mean, it's it's about solidity, but it's mostly like language language design, yeah. Um, the next thing that we are like very excited about it's the Solidity Summit. So at the end of April we will have a, a language two-day language summit here in Berlin. It's a two-day friendly-sized single-track event with talks and workshops. So if you're interested uh, uh, in attending this, then just navigate to the URL and sign up for it. And um, yeah, we are happy to um, receive proposals for talks, workshops. Um, yeah, it would, would be very nice to, to see you there. Uh, otherwise, we're very approachable on various online and offline resources. You can post issues and feedback and uh, feature ideas on GitHub. You can visit us in the Gitter chat. And you can, be, you can participate in our Google Hangouts meeting twice a week where you can either just listen in, talk to us, uh, ask questions of if you want to do stuff yourself. We are always happy to help and direct you to interesting issues. Another thing we forgot to mention, if you have projects in Solidity that compile on the current version, uh, please approach us. We would love to integrate them in our CI. And yes, I think... Questions? Well, you can always approach us later. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, Wait, there's a question. He asked how many people are currently working in the compiler. Uh, I think we're seven to eight now, but it's like um, only a few are full time and it's very spread over the week. Um, yeah, I, th I think eight to nine. I mean, there are people also involved in other projects in the foundation, for example, and they're just like coming in for a week, doing some stuff there. Uh, and we also, I mean, we have some external contributions. We are always trying to see how, incre how to increase that. Mm, yeah, but I think like eight to nine should, should be fine, yeah.